Liverpool have just beaten PSG 3-2 with a dramatic late Bobby Firmino winner. I'm Jonathan Higgins here for OTB AM. We're going to find out what the fans thought of that. You can't find nothing now to top that. That is the best. That's the best atmosphere in the world. I wasn't expecting any less, to be honest with you. I made up that we turned up there tonight for the boys, obviously. Seems like we're fearless at the minute. The atmosphere was amazing. I mean, this is what European nights are all about, isn't it? This is two of the best teams in Europe coming head to head in a competition. Yeah, it's nights like tonight to remind you that this is why you keep coming back. You know, it's just, it's amazing. The European nights, you, you just couldn't miss it. it you travel anyway, you'd swim over the Irish Sea to get here. Andy Robertson. There were some really close contenders tonight, but Robbo for me was fantastic. He kept Mbappe in his pocket. There was a couple of moments where he lost him, but he kept his composure. He got his head straight back into the game. And I don't think as a manager you can ask any more from the young man. What is between Andy Robbo and James Miller for me? Uh, I thought they both worked hard, very hard, uh, dug deep and obviously on, on a night like tonight obviously you want to get on field on side and I thought Andy Robbo or James Milner for me definitely. Probably Andy Robertson I'd say, yeah he made Neymar look like he wasn't even on the pitch, he made Mbappe look like he wasn't even on the pitch so big respect to him, he's good, brilliant yeah. It's hard between Milner and Robbo, both of the one England, friends, one any one of them, why not them, any one yeah. of them, there's no way you can pick a man of the match, every one of them played too good, you know what I mean, and you know, you say they've got money, but we've got passion. We got up at half one this morning, I had to drive from Clarny in County Kerry in Ireland to Tralee, about a 40 minute drive, on a bus for four hours to Dublin, Dublin Port to Hollyhead, Hollyhead to here, was in Liverpool for about three o'clock and then made it to Anfield. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, Gary Neville's a man at the end of the day, so, you know, our boys need to concentrate on our football and we've done just that tonight, so made up for us, we just need to keep our blinkers on and focus on on whatever football is the next game, so I made up for the lads, honestly, really well played. There's no way you can forget about nights like that, why can't we go for everything? Playing like that, our strongest squad, you know, why can't we go for everything? Our team's unreal. We go for everything this season, we'll win the Champions League, we'll win the league, easy. Done. If that's the mentality in Manchester United, like, you can have it that way, but in, in, uh, in, Liver in Liverpool, it's completely different, European nights are special and that's the way it'll be. I feel exactly the same about the Gary Neville comment as I did the day he made it, which was Manchester United are in this tournament and they're afraid of us. Manchester United are afraid of us and on that performance they should be. So there we are, that's what the fans thought after a magical night at Anfield. That's what European football is all about. I'm Jonathan Higgins for OTB AM. Right, so I can uh, welcome Simon Hughes to the programme now to talk about the game at Anfield last night. Simon, you were there. It looked like, um, you know, we were talking about those cliched, amazing European nights at Anfield, but this is right up there. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's strange at the start of a season uh, and you're in September and you're talking about a really important European fixture. Um, you know, 10 minutes before the kickoff, it, it was very quiet inside Anfield and I was thinking, you know, is, is it going to be... One of those nights of people, is it just too early in the season for a really important game, which is going to sort of define the way things are going to be? And and suddenly, you know, on kickoff, you know, the noise was deafening. And I think Liverpool players, you know, reacted to that and, and, and then, you know, made it even more hostile for, for the Paris Saint-Germain players because uh, Liverpool starts off so well. Um, you know, really on the front foot. I think they had eight corners in the first 25 minutes, which, you know, I doubt the Paris Saint-Germain have come across that sort of bombardment in, in the French League. Um, yeah, I just think that Liverpool, just, just just touching on what was just said there, I mean, I, I do agree. I think that Liverpool probably learnt more and will take a lot more from from having the setback of of, of, um, of conceding the two goals and then and then finding a way to recover and actually win the game. They, they haven't done that before um, against top-quality opposition under Jurgen Klopp. Um, and I think it's it's the sort of thing that you know players talk about. You know that when they, when they, they refer back to moments where they've been in really sticky patches and and try to find you know some energy resources and and some you know let's let's be honest. You know as soon as Paris Saint Germain scored, Liverpool were sort of back on the front foot straight away and and trying to attack and with purpose. You know it didn't seem to to shape them as much as you would you would have thought. And I thought that was just so impressive the way Liverpool did that. Um, and despite what Thomas Tuchel says after the game, um, where he seems a little bit confused about you know why things had ended the way they had, uh, I think it probably was quite difficult to compute because you wouldn't expect a team who's probably got you know a, a, a track record of throwing away leads to then come back and and actually win the game, having thrown away a lead. So 
I just think it, it's such an enormous victory for Liverpool. It'll give them, you know, a massive amount of confidence. And you know, it's an, in, in, in the in the sort of the small details of this period of the season, it's, it's really important as well because obviously Napoli drew uh, last night in um, in Belgrade, and and if Liverpool is the you know drawing the, 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 the not being up against it, but under pressure to to really get something in Naples in a couple of weeks' time. So yeah, it just I think it ticks all the boxes on a in a number of ways. Yeah, just on that topic of confidence, like looking at some of Jurgen Klopp's comments this morning in the newspapers, he talks about this idea of if you put yourself into his shoes two or three years ago, that this sort of night would be almost unimaginable that Liverpool fans have to be quite appreciative of where they've come from to get to this point where they're beating one of Europe's best and outclassing a team at the class of PSG on a night like last night. Like, is that a significant moment last night, in your view, where Liverpool have finally proven that, yes, they are finally good enough to go toe-to-toe with Europe, despite the fact that most of us would have suspected that this was already the case even 12 months ago? Yeah, I think I think it is easy to be blase a little bit mm. about it, uh, because, you know, Liverpool have travelled a long distance in a short period of time. I mean, I think when Liverpool beat Borussia Dortmund, I think I put my, in my report, I hope this was right, the, the, there was 10... Uh, Klopp has made ten changes since that night when they, they went and beat Borussia Dortmund, and if you th- in the Europa League, which was you know two and a half years ago, and on that night, you could say that Liverpool were quite fortunate really to win the game, you know, in cold analysis. But last night, you know, it was a very different sort of game, um, very different sort of performance. You know, Liverpool, you know, as we, as we discussed, have had the lead, and you know, easy to say thrown away, but you are playing against absolute top quality opposition, you know, in attack, you know, Neymar and Mbappe, despite Liverpool's dominance, particularly in the first half, were, were such a threat on the counter-attack. And they were always going to have chances. You can't, if, if you're going to attack a team that quality, you, you're always going to surrender some opportunities to the opposition when they've got that, that level of quality. It's, it's just the nature of football. I think it's impossible not to. It's how you react in those situations and the, the strength of your goalkeeper and and, and many other things. But we, we've got that I, team up there now, actually. So, Mignolain goals, Klein, yeah. right back, Lovren, Sacco, centre backs, Alberto Moreno, <laughs> left back, Emre Chan, James Milner, Lalana, Firmino, Coutinho, and Divock Origi. Yeah, yeah. So it's two, it's two players. I got that wrong. <laughs> uh, oh, actually, so Firmino came Firmino's on. The so yeah, so it is one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Milner, Milner really symbolises this sort of resurgence from Liverpool because. Who would have said two years ago when he was, you know, stoically running up and down the, le- you know, the, the left wing from left back, that he'd now be, you know, which he is. Let, let's be honest. He was. I thought he was the best player on the pitch last night by a mile. Um, Milner, you know, he set the tone. Him and Henderson in midfield. I know. I know Jordan Henderson's got his critics, but I thought he was fantastic last night. He, it was a really important performance for him because in that area of the pitch where you've got Neymar and Mbappe and I know Cavani is sort of a, a much maligned centre forward, but he does score goals and drop into spaces, which is difficult to get around because he's so big. And I thought those two <laughs> were fantastic. But Milner, for me, you know, he's the last, you know, really survivor from that Dortmund game that started the game last night. And he was just outstanding from start to finish. And he has been in every game this season. He, he looks like he's... He's actually, you know, really embraced the the competition that Klopp's got in midfield now. And I think Klopp's doing it the right way because, you know, your, your players who've done well for you last season and you, you sign new players, I think bombing them out as, as early early on it, it probably sends out the wrong signals and it, it, this develops a trust around, you know, players that have, have got experience and players that have been there for a reasonable amount of time. And I, I just think it sends out all the right messages. And and for me, you know, James Milner has just been. Brilliant for Liverpool and looks at home at the very highest stage. Well, can I do we talk about um, Sturridge then? Because if Sturridge was to have any kind of a recovery akin to what James Milner has had, then suddenly this is the most attacking, most potent attacking force in, in mm-hmm. world football because we've seen the absolute peak of what Daniel Sturridge can do. And when he was fit for a period of time, he was absolutely sensational. It's a long time since we've seen that. But the headed finish last night in the first half was the type of instinctive goal that truly world-class scorers score. There were some issues in the second half, as, as Owen was pointing out a little bit earlier on. But like, for him to even be a functional member of the team, that you can afford to leave Firmino on the bench because of injury, like that's a sensational development, really. This is somebody who did not have any trust from the manager. Like, it seemed like at, even at the end of last season... 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's it's a remarkable recovery, and I, I think again, it sort of reflects the way Klopp thinks about football. That he tries his best to get every ounce of a player that he works with. I mean, we've seen how Sam and Yemenyele, for example, he's tried his best to sort of give him every opportunity to become Liverpool's number one, and obviously that didn't work out. But he will give chances, Jurgen Klopp, and. Who would have said last season while he was Daniel Sturridge was on loan at West Brom playing six games without scoring a goal and getting injured again that this sort of night and occasion would would be inside him? Um, and I thought last night, I mean, you, you could tell that he, Firmino is such a important player for Liverpool in terms of the, the the work rate that he offers. He allows the other players around him to play better. And I think when he doesn't play, you, you notice a, a bit of a drop in Liverpool's performances, particularly last season when Dominic Solanke and, and Danny Ings, who, who tried their best, but they're ultimately just not quite at that level. Whereas last night, I think Sturridge offered something slightly different. Um, you know, the, his movements and, his, as he just said there, his, his finishing, I think as a finisher, he's, he's probably the coolest and calmest at, still at the club. And if you can keep him fit, he's certainly... An improvement and a, a much better option than, than the two players that I just mentioned there last season. So, you know, if he were to contribute, you know, 10 to 15 goals throughout the course of this season, you know, I think um, it'd be an outstanding, you know, sort of recovery from him. Um, he's just got to stay fit and that, that's always been his problem really. And I I wouldn't have thought at the age of 29 that, that, that Klopp would still be offering opportunities to that sort of players. I think that's what sort of, you know, almost... Rem- uh, a, a, a nice subplot to the whole Liverpool story that it's not just you know the, the, this, the emergence of this team isn't a real, as much as it's about Virgil van Dijk signing for £75 million pounds and a goalkeeper for what was a world record fee there are a lot of players who, who just are contributing in, in, in a, a, you know very special ways that that um, that you just wouldn't have thought would have been capable of doing so and, and, and maybe Daniel Sturridge there might just be a bit more life left in him and uh, he could you know as he proved last night score against 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 the highest standard opposition well what it speaks to is a, a manager who is getting the most out of his available resources who is not bearing grudges who is actually just trying to manage things the way that you would do in the cold light of day if this was like a really easy thing to do when actually you know there's a, a thousand egos in uh, in that changing room that and the um, ownership structure and all the stuff the club has to deal with, it seems like he's kind of rising to his full potential himself at the moment as well. Definitely. I mean, I think this is now, I mean, it's clear that this is now Jürgen Klopp's team. I mean, it's, it's got his, his personality, you know, stamped all over it. Um, and Liverpool have become Jürgen Klopp's club. I mean, a lot has changed at Liverpool behind the scenes, you know, since... Um, since Jurgen Klopp came, and I just think his enthusiasm, his natural enthusiasm, as you know, I suppose, without being too corny, you know, Bill Shankly would would describe, which which I just think natural enthusiasm is such an important ingredient in any team, and you can see every single player just is loving playing football. You know, they're, they're absolutely loving playing that this style of football, and he's his presence has sort of sorted out a, a, a lot of. A lot of the problems that that, that were at Liverpool, um, I don't think the papers over the cracks. I think Liverpool have become a a club that's a lot more together, and things are you know sort of making a lot of sense in a way that they didn't in the past because of Klopp's guidance. And that had always been sort of my criticism of Fanway Sports Group because I think they thought that you know the, an inexperienced man is like Brendan Rodgers, which he was at the time. Who let's be, remember still took Liverpool as close to the title as they ever have, but. He, he didn't have that that sort of background or experience behind him to to know how to deal with certain situations which are you know going to arise when you're Liverpool's manager, which is a you know I, I still think it's it's the most one of the most difficult jobs in world football to to this challenge of trying to rise a club that hasn't won a league title in such a long period of time. And for me, Liverpool look like the that um you know the, the if if you don't go closer, much closer than they were last season, be very surprised. I mean, uh, I think for me, it, it, it's got to be between, you know, them, City and um, and, and Chelsea to to really, um, to, to, to have a real go at the Premier League this year. Yeah, 
it seems that every time Liverpool win a game now, there's a new stat on Twitter as to what the last year was when they won X amount of games yeah. consecutively. And the one that's on everybody's timelines this morning, I think, is 1961, the last time they won six really? competitive uh, matches, their first six competitive matches of the season. At what point does that begin to seep into the squad? Will it seep into the squad at all? You mentioned Bill Shankly there. It's obviously the, the club steeped in as much history as any other in European football, really. Do you think that Jurgen Klopp, of course he's aware of it, but do you think he'll allow that to kind of... Uh, heighten the, the sense of achievement that might be at the end of this road they're travelling down? Well, I mean, Jürgen Klopp is, is always adamant that he doesn't read any newspapers or, or things like that. Um, I don't think he... I think he, whatever stat or fact or piece of history that, that may weigh heavily on a manager's shoulders, he always tries to somehow turn it into an overwhelming positive Um you know, what I really sort of love about watching this Liverpool is that they almost play in a in a um, an unconscious an unconscious way. You know that they sort of everything's become very natural for the players. The players look like they're playing naturally in a way that perhaps some of the teams of the past, which have gone close, some of the players weren't playing in the most natural positions. Whereas Klopp has managed to find the most natural positions for each player and responsibilities for each player. And I just think they're so difficult. Difficult to beat as a, as, a, as a consequence of that. Um, the players seem like they're, they're being themselves off the pitch and on the pitch. And I know it sounds like a big Liverpool loving, and 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 it's a club which is a. I mean, I, I think I've written about this in the past where it is a prisoner of its past because as soon as you start achieving something, straight away you're reminded of of what happened 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, but, you know, Jürgen Klopp, it doesn't seem to bother him or phase him. He only ever tries to turn these these, these sort of facts that are thrown at him in, 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 into positives, which is reflecting on the pitch. I think it is at the moment. I mean, I don't even think Liverpool are playing at the very, very best just just yet, which is a really encouraging thing. I mean, Salah is, was, was OK last night. Mane was, was a threat. Obviously, Firmino didn't play. So you would think that when those three guys sort of click into gear, they're, they're, they're going to be very difficult to stop. Yeah, it's all it's all very positive. History <laughs> teaches us that no team manages to ride a season as spectacularly well as Liverpool have started it the whole way through. So at some point we're going to see what their reaction is to a setback and um, I guess Simon will catch up with you then. Thanks a million for talking to us. No worries. Here's what Kenny Cunningham thought of Liverpool last night. Brilliant victory from Liverpool. Uh, looked as if they'd shot themselves in the foot, had the opportunity to put the game to bed at 2-1 to get 3-4-1, to four, one, didn't take them. And not for the first time at this level, you're, you're made to play clinical from PSG in terms of winning the ball back off Liverpool. A good finish from Mbappe, it looked as if they're going to steal a point from the, from the game. But credit to Liverpool, kept pushing, and James Milner in particular, like I said, looked as if PSG were going to break up the pitch, made the decision to get close, win back possession for his team 10 yards outside the PSG uh, penalty box that was absolutely crucial it kept the ball in the danger area eventually they walked it to the feet of Firmino and he had a huge amount to do oh, and we were glancing at the TV screen you weren't thinking goal here mm. you know he done, he done fantastically well just kind of fainted to shoot off his left left hand side checked onto his right and then just arrowed the ball into the far corner brilliant uh, brilliant finish yeah, you will be with us again tomorrow evening to give your more considered take and everything there. But just briefly, we've got about a minute before we wrap, the idea of winning it late. Like, say, the absolute body blow that Spurs would have taken earlier on, it obviously yeah. works in the other direction for Liverpool, where that win, it's actually a much bigger win, it'll feel to them, than it would have been if they'd held out a 2-0. Yeah, yeah, you almost feel invincible, I would have thought, Owen, going forward, because you never doubt yourself. You almost feel as if you're never beaten. Like, going forward now in this competition, even the, in the Premiership, you know, find, if you find yourself in a situation of getting pegged back or behind, you keep believing. You know what I mean? You don't, you, your head doesn't get down because you know you've done it before mm. and you can do it again. So it's a great victory in one respect, you're right. But psychologically, in terms of winning the, the game that late against a team of this quality is absolutely huge from a psychological point of view. The Graham Hunter is on the line. Good morning to you, Graham. How are you doing? Yeah, well, I'm not quite as enthusiastic as Hurricane Higgins, but near it. <laughs> I'd say you are, though. I mean, uh, we were deigning to begin to pretend that maybe Leo Messi might be on some kind of gentle, slow decline. But uh, last night he blew off the cobwebs with uh, his customary hat trick. Yeah, Jerry, you're not Danish, and um, you've just said that to make a good conversation because I know you too well. 
you never for a second uh, thought Leo Messi was any slippery slope. I remember when we set up the season, uh, we were talking on this uh, this beautiful Skype medium, and um, we talked about the way in which Leo Messi assumed the armband from Andres Iniesta, stood up before the Boca Juniors game in the Gamper tournament, and I made a short speech, but um, nonetheless a, an impactful one. When he speaks, people listen. He's done more of that speaking recently, um, talking about Ricky Puch, the kid coming through, Artur, the Brazilian, who he thinks is wonderful. Everything thinks is wonderful except for the coach, Valverde, doesn't seem to want to play him, apart from a little cameo last night, which was brilliant. And the thing that Leo Messi said was, I've inherited this captain's armband from really important people, great footballers, Chabi, Iniesta. And the thing I promise you all, you can finish the sentence. He told the crowd that he had a thorn in his side and that his single most important task would be to bring them back this traditional, beautiful, historic trophy that we love so much. And he was talking about the Champions League trophy. And one of the things I've learned, maybe because you cover so many different sports so well and off the ball, maybe this is happening to your listeners or to you, but when an individual, a brilliant individual, male or female, a sports person or a team, outright focuses on something in a way that's akin to, say, a a place kicker, um, focusing on the ball, going through the posts or somebody who's got the yips or maybe driving straight and, and they focus and, and the sports psychology comes in. When a group as talented as, say, Real Madrid, Liverpool, United or Barcelona, say, as a group we're focused on this particular target above anything else, what tends to happen, and Real Madrid is a case in point, is that they do it. The psychology of saying, get everything else out of the way, this is our this is what we're going to put all our efforts towards and this is where we'll find our our special peaks it tends to happen which is why i put barcelona before last night in a group of probably only four clubs i believe can win the champions league they're city liverpool atletico madrid uh, and barca that's that's my group and i go back to the performance messi said it's my duty it's my job and yeah he stood out with that eighth champions league hat trick Two of the goals were extremely good. One of them was just routinely good. Um, but the thing I thought was really important, hand back to you, was that all around him, players woke up. Um, it was only PSV, but they played very cleverly. The players woke up in a way that they're going to need to do if they're going to avoid the smashings they took in Paris, Turin and Rome over the last three seasons. Rakitic was at it. PK was extraordinary. Ter Stegen wants to win back the number one place um, from Manuel Neuer, which he should have had all summer. Dembele has found a new level um, of maturity because the skill level was there. And Coutinho played, um, even though he didn't score, one of his best, most complete games for Barca last night. And across the team, you could pick up Busquets or whatever. And I'm beginning to sound like the fans at Anfield last night talking to Hurricane Higgins, but they were very good. (laughs) Yeah. Liverpool were very good last night. You do uh, you, you you said pre-tournament you thought that uh, they were one of four teams who can win it. So presumably last night just made you even more confident that this is a, a team who are actually built for success in the Champions League particularly. I think they are. I think the squad's been reconstructed. So we haven't seen very much of Vidal yet. Um, we've seen glimpses of the guy called Malcolm, the Brazilian winger bought from Bordeaux to such embarrassment for poor old Roma who had fans waiting at the airport for him. <coughs> Um, Dembele has changed. Dembele at 21, just turned 21, and, and somebody who's... You remember, how, footballers sometimes who are born very tall, never learn to jump, and therefore you look at a six-foot-four guy, um, often particularly strikers, and because they've always been taller, they never... Dembele's always had this extraordinary pace and this natural change of balance that throws people in quite quick feet, and therefore... He's never had to learn um, some of the housekeeping around him that makes you an elite footballer rather than just a very attractive one. But you can see he's learning that. And one of the things that makes me think that Barcelona are a genuine threat to win this tournament is that he's changing. And over the last couple of seasons, what we've seen is Luis Suarez, um, I think it's one goal in 13 Champions League matches now, and only one away goal in about three years um, in the Champions League. So either he has to change, which I'm not convinced is going to happen in the away matches, let's see, or somebody else has to take the burden off Messi. You talked about constructed to win it. I think across the board, Barcelona are going to see more Champions League goals from 
say, um, some from Malcolm, some from Munir, but principally from Dembele and Coutinho, spreads the loads. Um, Messi has other foils in the team to open space, to beat players, and therefore walking, you know, a shoe in walking all the way into lifting up the title next June. I'm not saying that. They've been pretty eight-stone weaklings since they won the treble in 2015. Teams have bullied them. Big teams have known how to do damage to them. I think it's changing a little bit. And I think also I detect, we'll come back to this, I detect Gerard Piquet thinking, you know, and I'll own the Davis Cup. Um, I'm into esports and a big investment with Cesc Fabregas and, and Leo Messi. He's got employees in his online football game. Gerard Piquet's work, the last thing left of Gerard Piquet's football world is actually playing the game because his head and is, is in all kinds of other things. But he's not losing his focus or his performance level because, and again, this is interpretation rather than hard fact, I think he wants to sign off, no longer a Spain player, he wants to sign off with Champions League victory or victories and for his level right now, his competitive level is brilliant. He's digging the team out a lot because they're counter-attacked against. Therefore, although I don't make them outstanding single favourites, they're really entertaining to watch right now. And I think that they're better constructed. Graham, I, I cannot believe that you've left Juventus out of your four-team group capable of winning the Champions League. They do have the best footballer in the world right now. Yeah, Dybala, is it? <laughs> Would you like to specify? Well, I uh, know I'm, I'm, you know, obviously, you're, you're I think a Messi I guy. I think night. over the last, I think I if you look at say night. the what, what FIFA think and their uh, shortlist for the best, if we take that, I know it's something that kind of grinds your gears at the moment. You could take that in isolation. You could take the World Cup in isolation. <laughs> you could take the last six months in isolation, and you know the Ronaldo clan are going strong. But like, no matter what side you're on in that debate, do you not think that his addition to the side this year? Do you think they've lost too much to to put in a real challenge to win the Champions League this year? They're obviously in action tonight. I just think that maybe when it comes to Liverpool and Manchester City, Juventus, and particularly when it comes to Atletico Madrid, Juventus are right up there. Look, um, it would be foolish of me to say that um, your arguments don't um, have weight. I do like your Al Bundy modern family, guess what grinds my gears thing, that's very good <laughs> indeed. Um, I'll tell you this, when Juve had their real big chances, 2015 in Berlin against Barcelona, and then in Cardiff, a couple of years later against Real Madrid, with stronger uh, squad than they have now, and I think a better starting eleven, they they blew it for one reason or another. They didn't have that cutting edge. They're one of the unfortunate teams, in my opinion, despite how close eventually Napoli looked as if they might run them uh, last season, that don't operate in a league which is sufficiently testing week in, week out to make them keep them razor sharp for the Champions League uh, in terms of, until now, that that cutting edge that gets you over the line because they've, they've reached two finals. I don't believe that even though Cristiano Ronaldo adds them goals, that they are defensively strong enough. Um, I think it was time for Buffon to move on. I'm not a great believer in their replacement keeper. I don't think that they've got enough quality um, across the squad. And Maxi Allegri, in terms of being able to um, get a group, like, for example, what, what the hell happened at halftime in Cardiff when they're in the game and they all fall out with each other and start turning on each other. There's a dispute between the, the fan base, Allegri and Dybala, about what game time this pocket genius, who could be the player that gives them the extra edge, um, how much he should have. I'm going to watch them at the Mestalla tonight. And frankly, because Valencia are having so many difficulties psychologically from being um, a team in a hurry to now a team that's hurrying things, making rash passes, going offside when they shouldn't, injury plagued, there's a fighting chance you've, you've to take maybe a big dividend from the Mestalla tonight in a match that they could have feared if Valencia were in top gear. I, across their um, side, I see ageing players. I see players who until now haven't been good enough. And while Ronaldo will make them, is there specifically to do what you say they might be able to do. He's there to win the Champions League. He's, he's there in, in his mind to win the treble, his first ever treble, and to tilt at the Ballon d'Or again. But I, I don't have Juventus in my group, and I don't believe that come June you'll be sort of doing this to me and saying, see, I told you so, in, in Irish or in Italian. Graham, great stuff. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks a million.
Enjoy your football. Have a look at them now. Have a look at these. So uh, Barcelona beat PSV 4-0. Inter beat Spurs 2-1. Spurs were 1-0 up with about five minutes left to go in that game. Inter equalised, went completely ma- mad. And you're thinking, OK, that's going to be a one-all draw because it's Inter. And then, no, it's Spurs. It's uh, Inter Milan 2, Spurs 1. Club Brugge 0, Borussia Dortmund 1. Uh, Red Star Belgrade 0, Napoli 0. Have you got a proper pronunciation of... Kervnus <laughs> Vezde. Galatasaray beat Lokomotiv Moscow 3 0, Liverpool beat Paris Saint Germain 3 2. Atletico were in Monaco and won 2 1, and uh, Schalke beat Porto. Sorry, Schalke and Porto drew 1 all. Um, we were chatting yesterday. Uh, like Man City are the favourites for the competition. That didn't make any sense to me. Definitely would have had like, Liverpool as big as 12 1 pre kick off last night. I'm sure they've come in. Well, one's a great price for Liverpool, even pre kick off. I know it's it's quite revisionist to say that, that after what we've just witnessed at Anfield and all that, but I think that's a fantastic price. City, so what is it? City, Barcelona, then Liverpool, probably at this point. Um, like, I'm not sure about I'm not sure about Graham's discounting of Juventus completely. Like, when you have the best player in the world in your team, and this is the most obvious point you could ever make about any sport, you've got a chance of winning the tournaments that you are playing in. Like, we could play alongside Cristiano Ronaldo and we'd feel that we have a chance of winning the Champions League. No? I mean, yeah, probably not. <laughs> they realised pretty quickly. Uh, that played guy, up front, like. That guy, if, he's not really, shouldn't really be here. If he played on the left of the three, I was in the middle and you were on the right. We'd, actually, we'd be fine. It's like, it would just be Ronaldo. We'd kind of make decoy runs or jogs and uh, Ronaldo would do all the work and we'd, we'd go all the way. I think, um, so Barcelona are sixes at the moment. Uh, Bayern Munich are eight. Juve are six or seven, no thanks. Real Madrid, as big as nine in some places. Um, generally eight, Paris Saint-Germain, nine or ten, no thanks. And Liverpool are now into um, between seven and nine to one to win, so yesterday. And still have nine to one. Huge, huge price movement from, but the value was yesterday, because then obviously you could have backed them each way. You could have, you could have had four teams and then... You, you live and learn, you live and learn. No. You, you say this now and then you forget this time next year and there are three weeks and you're like, oh, that was so shit in this. Uh, it's kind of the same with the NFL. You, did you back um, the Rams? Uh, I was going to. I, they've gone into, I see their number one at ESPN's power rankings. They were at, what, 13 to 1 before the season started, was it? What have they gone into now? Like no, no, I seven checked. or eight. Yeah, no, there's no point in, uh, in checking all the stuff that you should have done when it comes to this. Um, the other thing was Spurs were very Spursy last night. Yeah. Like, it's an away game. They're playing well. <coughs> They're doing it despite a bit of criticism of the um, management for not bringing all their players. But they looked tired at the end. Mm. Is, it, is this going to be the story of them? Oh, Spurs look a bit tired. Maurizio Pochettino looked a bit tired as well. He wasn't happy afterwards. We rarely see a Tecci, Maurizio Pochettino. And last night it was very, I don't want to use the word confrontational, but he, he wasn't happy with some of the questions being thrown his way in the press conference afterwards, questions of the team, questions of the players. He maintains that it was their best performance of the season. I'm not sure you can really use that as a backup when you're 1-0 up in the 85th minute and you end up losing the game. It doesn't matter what your best performance of the season is, even if your performance knocked all your other performances out of the water. That's just not good enough. And Three defeats in a row as well. Yeah. That's the other bit that, like, okay, so there's a, an international break in the middle of it all, 